Okay. Um, am I recording? Yep. You are. Right. Uh, what myths do you think would you most like to shatter that there are around Radiohead? Uh, there's there's one apparently about me. Once plane's gone. Sorry. There's one myth about me being a uh, an angry young man with no cause to be angry, whatever that means. Sulky little git. Uh, I am a sulky little git whenever the press around because I hate the press. So I think that's fair enough. Therefore, the myth is reinforced, you know. But um, that's their problem. Sorry. You're gonna have to shut that door. Yeah, shut that door. But I don't think it'll make any difference either. Sorry. Uh, yeah. That's, well, I, I don't know. I don't mind them. You know, they're all right. It's like school bullies, aren't they? Really? They decide on something, and that's it. Right. It's one very good reason to uh, leave Britain. I think. Leave Britain. Did you say? Sorry. I'm just... um, so, do you find? I mean, do you think your music is particularly British, though? I mean, to what extent is it about coming from here and the sort of references and stuff that you must have grown up with? The American kids say don't. I wonder what Johnny said to that. Um, this isn't, it's not. No, no, it's alright. I think. Uh, I'm just getting really bad sound on this. this Should we start from the top? We'll stop. Let's stop. No, okay, so um, I saw you just read that you described your album as flawed. First album of flawed. <laughs> to what extent is the new reaction, new one, a reaction against these faults in the first one, the flaws? Oh, well, we were just really, really young when we did it. You know, really sort of hardly been playing as a band, never really been in a studio. Just got signed to a huge label, completely freaked out, and and hadn't done the gigs. You know, basically. Which is a really unfashionable thing to say, but we'd like to be, uh, you know, making records uh, five, ten years from now. Whether anyone buys them or not is, is you now obviously they have to buy them, otherwise, we can't make them. Right. Fair enough. Um, you've criticised compartmentalised pop. Don't you, f you feel that the fact that you strive, sorry. In fact, the fact that you strive not to be compartmentalised is, is the reason why people in this country, in the music press, were so slow to pick up on you. Maybe. Uh, maybe because we're crap to begin with as well. It's very honest. Uh, also... Well, no, I don't think that anymore because I suppose, you know, they have to have something to write about and if they don't have the language in which to write it and the way somewhere to put something, they can't write about it. I suppose it's the nature of the, the business, you know? Right. But I still don't, I don't, I don't, I still don't understand what has to happen. I don't understand why music can't be music, you know? Why it has to be all this other shit. Yeah, I mean, we did, um, Adrian Sherwood once, and he just said, music is lovely, and just the business is horrible. It's not that horrible. It is horrible, but it's... It's quite cutthroat. It's, it's exactly the same as everything else. It's the same as every other business. It's just the people that um, work within it, the people that desperately want to get away from the fact that that they have to deal with business. Makes sense? Yeah, no, that, probably not. I think that does make sense. Well, what I meant earlier about the philosophy. I mean, you were saying that you're complete control freaks. I mean, is there? Yeah. I mean, is there any sort of um, ideology or anything that is behind that, that control? sort of guiding it. Yeah. The ideology really there's there's a lot of stuff wrapped up in it that I'm realising now. A lot of stuff I have problem with um, in terms of the media. I think it's sort of and I I mean the media in the sort of looser sense of the term. I think half the reason we ended up calling ourselves Radiohead is because see a lot of people who who, who uh, just receive, everything, everybody just receives information and uh, there's a huge gap between this receiving information and suddenly um, being partaking in the creative process and being a creative person and I've always thought 
that there, there should, shouldn't be any link. The two should just flow into each other. But they don't because, um, because of the way the media is set up. That they, they, they're on high and you, you sort of, they condescend to tell you what's new and you should listen to. Whereas uh, I think the total opposite should be ca the case, where you know um, people who, who people should be exposed as much as possible, and then make their own choice, and then it get written about, and it would be a cyclical process. Um, I think the thing that kills popular culture is the fact that uh, certain people uh, with a lot of power or cash uh, are able to tell other people what to go out and buy. You know, you can go in H and V and our price, and you're told what to buy. You don't have a choice. Like ten years ago, you could go into a record shop, probably not H and V and our price, and go through the records and go up to the counter and say, "What's this one like?" And they'll play you a track, whatever. You know, you can actually sort of have an active part in choosing your records. Nowadays, you don't get that, and we think that's complete bullshit. And I think, for some reason, that. That's what's been going through my head in the past two or three weeks. Uh, and I think actually that has quite a lot to do with what we're about. Because uh, on the one hand, we just make music. But we don't just make music because we've all been involved in other things. Um, like Colin. Carol, carry on. Just clump the mic. Oh, did I? Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> just got to use bomb the ear. Carry on. No, so like. So, like, well, Colin like, worked in our price for a year. Mm. Uh, and. Ed was sort of, when he was at college, he was, he was doing loads of promotion and stuff like that, of bands and things. And I was DJing at college. Um, uh, I don't know, I, think, I just think it could be a lot better. I think that, that the reason that we, we keep going and we have a sort of real work ethic, uh, as Ed would put it, uh, about what we do, is like we work our nuts off because uh, we see so many bands who don't and we think, why you know I don't you know you're given this amazing opportunity to to, to share what you're doing uh, and people just sort of skin up and fall over and don't do anything you know which is fine sometimes but we're almost the extreme opposite with the the, the, the highly stressed uh, executives sort of you know in the board meeting that have been up for three weeks drinking too much coffee uh, and then uh, yeah that's that's how we approach what we do right okay that, that, that was a very good answer took um, a while isn't it sorry well no because you said uh, sort of covered quite a lot of the questions i was going to ask you actually if you felt the press um should their job was to create or to observe and report and you answered that off the top of your own back, you've been looking at my questions, haven't you? No, no. <coughs> what is it, to what extent is it a <coughs> therapy for you, actually, songwriting? Um, uh, I think that, that um, <coughs> certain things I put in songs, because that's the only place I can put them, and then other things I put in songs, and actually regret that I've done it, because it's so personal, that I can't actually look at it again, straight in the eye. So I think actually sometimes it's too much like therapy. Uh, but everybody else tells me, no, no, it's great, wow, it's really upsetting. And I, I'm going, yeah, but it's, it's me, yeah. You know. Uh, Do you think that's one of the jobs of a, of a, of a rock star, to, so that other people can live out aspects of their lives through you? I hope not. Maybe. No, because I think everybody, every, everyone who's creative, is doing that anyway. I think maybe I just, I've always kind of done it. I've always sort of put certain things on, on the edge of my sleeve, sort of, for people to, to pick at, you know, because that's what I'm like. It wouldn't, it wouldn't matter if I wasn't a creative person, I would still be doing that. It's just that ever since I was a kid, that's kind of what I've been doing. Uh, like, when I was, five or six I was making models out of Lego and exhibiting them on, on the front of the television for people to, to sort of say what they thought and say how wonderful they were and things like that and I've kind of been doing it ever since and I suppose I kind of need it now and <clears throat> uh, so I think songs are th therapy in the sense that I've always had it to prop me up 
so in a sense they're therapy because I've lived with them lived with the idea of being able to be creative and express myself without it I'd, I'd be in the loony bit definitely right. do you um, have strange dreams? I never remember my dreams actually ever hardly at all unfortunately it's a shame yeah I know well, it's just quite, well it's probably a shame for you <laughs> it's a big shame for me because I was quite curious no no so I was wondering because I was yeah like you're talking about cathartic well I was sort of saying that this therapy writing you know you can also say that sort of dreams as a sort of um, somewhere where these things are stored and you know, not articulating myself at all no 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 I mean if, if I think probably if I was that in tune with my dreams then um I wouldn't write the way I write, which is sort of see what I mean. I kind of tend to use uh, everyday objects and everyday things that happen rather than anything desperately cosmic, because it's the kind of the way I am. It doesn't mean that the emotions behind using choosing these things are any less relevant. Uh, it's just I can't write about you know green people and fluffy clouds and things because. It would sound ridiculous if I said it. Certain people could get away with it, you know. And and B, it would it just um, it wouldn't make any sense to me. So, but I mean, that's what people like about your music is it's actually appealing to them. Yeah, you're saying in a way that, that other people would say I relate to that. And well, I think it's it's funny. I think maybe it's because it's <clears throat> to, to yeah, it's to do with the fact that the the songs that I write and the words that I use are quite commonplace. But the fact that I put them in a song. Is something people relate to. I think that's part of it. I've always just sort of used common things that you like, just picking up rubbish, picking up people's phrases and stuff off TV. It's like a pop artist stealing, using photographs or something. Yeah, it's like photo montage. Yeah. How pretentious? Yes, oh, yeah. fairly. Sorry, they'd lead you on to that. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, but I mean, you're saying you've done the record cover. I mean, are you interested in visual arts and things? Well, yeah, I, I did a. Well, I did, did a degree in it. <laughs> yeah. Uh, uh, Polytechnic Southwest. Uh, uh, it was a combined course with Exeter University. I was doing English at Exeter University, and I was doing fine art, as they called it, at Poly Southwest. Like that, it wasn't fine art. To well, you. well, I, I like the phrase fine art because it's so ridiculous, you know. But I like the fact that it's spelled that okay. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, uh, what is it that pushes you to adopt the position of an outsider? I mean, have you, is it that you've never fitted in? Or? No, it's because the people inside are jerks. All right, then. That's a good, good answer. Um, if pop music can change the world, what change would you like to bring around? Bring about? Pop music can't change the world. Uh, pop music changed the world as Live Aid. Uh, and Live Aid got taxed by the British government. So that didn't change anything, did it? Really, you know. I, I think, I have a, fr I have a real f fucking problem with with pop stars who think they can change the world with their music. It's a real '80s thing, anyway. I mean, it, it was it never really happened until the '80s, and it was a, a lot of a lot of bands, a lot of artists with with failing careers and failing back catalogues. Sorry, I'm I'm really really cynical about that. I just. Doing work for charity is fine, uh, but things like Live Edge, you know, there's, there was not the trouble with doing charity gigs or doing this. Why we're kind of hesitant about doing the charity gig we're doing today for a while, um, because I have a real problem with with pop stars who do work for charity and say. Uh, you know, here we are. You know, we're going to change the world, or whatever. Uh, uh, and places like Rwanda, where you know there's, there's a military government or whatever wiping out all these millions of people. Uh, and where did they get the arms from? You know, they got them from the West. You know, people, we sell these, we sell, sell these poor little countries, all this, all these armaments, make shitloads of money out of them. They blow each other away. Then we send them little bits of money to sort of feed the starving. And I've never once heard a pop star say, well, hang on, you know, all we're doing is selling them arms so they can blow themselves away. 
surely that's what I should be writing about. Not, you know, oh, let's, you know, let's, I mean, obviously, someone's got to patch up the plasters, but, you know, every, every, every citizen of every Western country knows full well that if they had a responsible government, they'd do it anyway. You know, they wouldn't be selling them arms, but they would be clothing, you know, they'd be helping these, you know, it's bullshit. It's all fucking bullshit. It's all just putting little plasters over huge, great wounds. And that's why I hate it. And I think pop, pop stars changing the world is, is just, just pop stars with a bad conscience and pure ignorance. That's what I think. <laughs> okay. I mean, do you kind of, are you kind of against dog, dog medicine? I mean, you... I wouldn't, I would never get involved in politics because I don't li believe in politics as, as something to get involved in. You know, politics is, should be about the individual. Um, which is why I sort of scratched my head when REM was, was sort of making, making speeches at Clinton's inauguration and stuff. I thought, hey, that makes no sense to me at all, you know. You know, Clinton ultimately is, is working within, within a set power structure uh, and licking a certain set amount of arses in order to do so. Um, uh, I don't know. My politics are about the individual uh, as a as a responsible citizen, and I think that, like, being a person in Britain and sending money to charity or getting involved in politics, it's 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 all about sort of no no one talks about anything to do with collective responsibility, you know, that that our government goes out and does all these fucking ridiculous things. And we are ultimately responsible. We can't say, oh, well, it's politics. You can't sort of put politics in a corner and say, let's go talk about politics now and then walk away again. It doesn't work like that. You know, we're human beings. We don't work like that. But over the past sort of 50 years, the media has created this thing called politics and, and the intellectual establishment, which, you know, you, go, you walk there and you talk about politics, then you walk and you shut the door and you leave and you carry on with your life, which doesn't make any sense to me. And it's... Sorry, I'm talking right. crap. Sorry. No, no, but you, that's, that will edit up well, I think. But you don't, um, all right, that's, that's, so they wouldn't write an overtly political song, mm. they're all kind of political in terms of relationships, human relationships, that's what Yeah, basically. yes, well done. Yes. yes, that's what I thought you were saying. All right, then, um, do you think, we were talking about the media earlier, do you think that, say, something like the 60s, or the, all these, these revivals that are coming at the moment, are um, to do with the fact that the media didn't overexpose <laughs> things so much in the 60s, so, you know, there's like a mob thing supposed to be happening, you know, you're not, you know, there's very few interviews with the Kings, you know, or the Beatles around that people get to see, and it's a lot more sort of mysterious, um, and people's imaginations can... Sort of yeah, so, yes, yeah, I'm sure the imagination thing, yeah, really comes into play, I think also, though, that... Uh, Well, I think it's really weird that people our age, right, who are in bands, everyone always refers to, you know, this... You're, you're constantly up against the 60s, and now the 70s, and the 80s. It's sort of... You know, having, having to sort of... These, again, you know, you're, you're bombarded by these things. You're not allowed to just say, well, you know, we're a band in 1994 playing this music. And okay, it might have this reference or this reference or this reference, but you know everything has references. What? Why? Why do we have to be mods? Why do we have to be uh, any of those things? But you know, Woodstock was classic. You know, the Woodstock Two was a classic example of of, of a generation being told um, the '60s were great. Yeah. You loved the '60s. You weren't actually there, but now you're walking around in exactly the same clothes as your parents wore, listening to exactly the same albums. Don't you think that's a little bit sad? Just, just a little bit sad. I think it is, but I do. But I think it's sad. I think it's a bit. I think, but I think it's you know, it's because uh, it's because people don't have as much money now. People our age don't have the spending power. The spending power is with the over thirties, and the over thirties are still in sixties and seventies. That's that's the bottom line. People who've got the money are over thirty. Therefore, our culture is fucked. Yeah. Makes sense.
Do you, um, hang on, I was going to come back on you on something you said about the, the um, before you said money, what did you say? Just Woodstock. Before? Yeah, you're talking about Woodstock. I was going to sort of interesting kind of two anecdotes, things that have happened. I mean, we interviewed Pavement the other week, and they used to have this bloke called Gary that managed to like, run over two other members of the van and fall out of a plane, I and mean, it was taxing along the runway or something, and took lots of acid and stuff. I just wondered, were there any interesting things that happened on with Radio Heat that were, were like that while you were touring? <laughs> well, not many people we know take acid. So, um, well, no, it didn't have to be. That was just one of the yeah. things that happened to come up in the conversation. It wasn't like a... No, I know, but... Um, uh, there, there are a few, but the, our anecdotes, I think they tend to be really, really boring. If we sat down, you know, we we'll get asked this a lot and we can never really think of anything. I mean, there's kind of a million things, like every day that you're in the US is another anecdote. But to actually come up with an example, I mean... Weird things happen when you travel anyway, don't they? Well, yeah, every day, you know, that's, that's one of the best things about it, I think. Uh, uh, so you think you live a particularly rock and roll lifestyle then? I don't think that. I think it exists for certain people still. You know, they tend to be the people that are still dressing up in their parents' clothes and still taking acid and thinking it's really cool. Um, and acid probably is fairly cool. Uh, I don't know. But... Um, I don't see why I have to take it to uh, be part of it, or part of whatever this is. I don't want to be in Primal Scream anyway, that crap. <laughs> um, well, I haven't gone through my questions in order, so I haven't said that. Yes, that's what I was going to say about the Woodstock thing. Ah, ow, ow. Shit. Do you think that... Um, that what you're saying about clothes and music, do you think that he's actually there sort of redundant as, it, as forms of expression? No, 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 not at all. No, um, no way. I mean, how could, how could they possibly not be? You know, it's just not possible. It's, it's always been like that, I think, hasn't it? Well, did, did I say legitimate forms of expression, but all right, then. No, all right, then. You've said no. <laughs> um, no, well, no, because... Well, for a start... I think clothes always are, but I, th I think that um, it's it's funny now because you you know you walk down um, your high street and 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 it, everything is recycled so fast now that it's, it's like nowadays I just think well you know you can wear whatever I think that's really good I think it's much better now I think that the, the clothes that people wear now are fucking great I think um, people look brilliant they've never looked as good as they do now. You know, we don't, we don't, do we don't have, yeah, we don't have that many people wearing flares. We don't have, you know, I quite like flares actually, but I'm not saying that. But, you know, every, every fashion has the ridiculous elements that you always go about afterwards. But it doesn't matter now because everyone, everyone's allowed to wear what they want now. I think that's really good. I think that also kind of reflects itself in music. Everyone can buy what they want now. It's just you're told to buy certain things and it doesn't make any sense you know because there is there everything is just sort of at, at, at your hand now because uh, everything is recycled so fast it's just going into a hole which i think is great if people looked at it positively rather than thinking oh my god you know pop's dying blah 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 right. okay. how in touch do you think you are with your sorry i didn't mean to dismiss that but no. how in touch do you feel you are with your feminine side I didn't ask John this one. <laughs> Sometimes. I, um, I can be really, really aggressive though. But uh, I can also be very feminine. I mean, do you see, when I ask the question, do you see it as um, feminine being kind of good in the nicer aspects of you, or do you... Yeah, pretty much. Right, I'm just interested. No, I, I, yeah, definitely. Um, my mum always wanted me to be a girl anyway, so... Unless she won't admit it.
Um, mm, what motivates you to write and perform? I mean, what is, is there anything particularly... I don't know, actually. <laughs> I really don't know. I do, I really do have your batteries running out. <coughs> right. Yeah, it's just uh, about to. I really do have. Is, to is there anything you want to say before you before the battery runs out? Because that's going to be it. Um, is there anything? Do you use? Uh, no. No. Um, can you say um, a hi? Can you can you do like a trailer for us? Yeah. For like this is I'm appearing on Dead Eye Video Magazine. Blah blah blah. Um, okay. Yeah. Okay. Hi, I'm Tom from, Ra Tom from Radiohead. I'm yeah. appearing on Dead Eye Video Magazine. Hi. I'm Tom from Radiohead. I'm appearing on Dead Eye Video Magazine.